Hello, my name is Carly, a member of the sales and marketing team at Gateway Foundation Alcohol and Drug Treatment Center, and I will be your moderator for today's one-hour training. I would like to remind you that for the audio portion of this webinar, participants may listen through their computer speakers or call in via telephone. The toll-free number is listed on your screen, and I will leave this here just for a moment for any participants who may be unable to hear me at this time. On behalf of Gateway Foundation, I would like to welcome you to our Understanding the Dangers and Cultures of Vaping webinar. Our goal at Gateway Foundation is to help people get their lives back on track and achieve a life of sobriety, free from drug use and symptoms of mental illness. Gateway Foundation is the largest non-profit treatment provider specializing in substance use disorders for men, women, adolescents, and clients diagnosed with co-occurring mental health disorders. Gateway Foundation is considered an in-network provider for most health insurance plans and accepts self-pay. We also accept state funding and provided over $2 million in charity care last year. Gateway Foundation offers a full continuum of substance use disorder treatment services. For over 50 years, we've been proven experts in addiction medicine. Gateway Foundation treats a national audience at 17 locations. At Gateway Foundation, our treatment is effective because it utilizes an integrated approach to treatment, which includes co-incurring or dual diagnosis treatment, medication-assisted treatment, relapse prevention, and much more. Now, before we begin today's training session, I'd like to share a few tips about interacting with the trainer during the webinar and details about securing your one CEU participation. First, a quick review of GoToWebinar controls. As you can see here, the controls appear on the right side of your screen. The orange arrow lets you show or hide your toolbar. The hand icon lets you participate throughout the presentation. At certain points, the trainer may ask questions and you can click this icon to participate. There's also a question box where you can type in your questions at any time during the presentation. Today's webinar will be conducted in listen-only mode to minimize any distractions or background noise. To confirm the audio is working, everyone please raise your hand if you can hear me by clicking on the hand icon on the webinar toolbar. Great, by the number of hands raised so far, it looks like most of our participants are ready to get started. The duration of today's webinar is one hour, so all the course material will be covered shortly after 1 p.m. There will also be a Q&A session after the presentation during which our trainer, Rachel, will answer questions submitted by participants. Again, you can submit a question at any time during the presentation and we will address as many as possible at the end. A quick note for those of you looking to receive a CEU for today's presentation. In order to receive one CEU, you must access the webinar for 60 minutes or more. And it's important to note that if you have a group of people in the room, only the person who registered and logged into today's presentation will be provided the CEU. CEU certificates will be delivered within four weeks of today's presentation. At this time, I would like to introduce our trainer, Rachel Obafemi. Rachel has been a member of Gateway Foundation's clinical team since 2011 and has over 20 years of experience in the field of mental health and substance use disorder. Rachel is a licensed clinical professional counselor as well as a certified addiction drug counselor. And now we welcome Rachel. Good afternoon, and I am so glad that you guys are joining. Hopefully today um, we will really you know, cover this topic in a way that is very helpful and useful to you in your current practice. And so with that, um, also hoping you have a little refreshment or uh, maybe you get to enjoy your lunch while you listen in as well. So originally, vaping or e-cigarettes were really promoted as a way to stop smoking. Um, another benefit of them is that no one can really smell that you are smoking or vaping, I should say. 
Um, and really, the other real perk to them, for any of you who may know someone who vapes, is that you can kind of vape anywhere. There aren't really any rules or laws or regulations that are widely known at this point, although they, there are some. So what I usually do when I go to hospitals and um, schools and work amongst other professionals and train, I usually kind of ask a show of hands. Um, you know, how many people really know someone or, you know, they themselves actually vape or use e-cigarettes? And we don't have to necessarily show a, um, hands raised at this point, but just to kind of think, you know, for your own life and your own perspective, you know, are you a vape smoker or should I say a vapor or a e-cigarette um, user? Um, and did it initiate with cigarette smoking? Um, and so that's one of the things that, you know, there's a real a positive atmosphere in many of our minds in some ways that someone who stopped smoking and is now vaping or using e-cigarettes, that's better. So we're going to really evaluate the risks of that, um, but also, um, you know, just in terms of thinking of our own personal experience, you know, most of the, the folks that I speak with, they will say that, in fact, the people who that they know, if it's not themselves, who have stopped smoking use, uh, cigarettes and have now switched to vaping uh, or e-cigarettes, they now have continued e-cigarettes and vaping. So it's, it's initially it was thought of a cessation device where they were able to uh, stop smoking, vape for a period of time, and then obviously the goal would be to discontinue use of all uh, smoking aids. But in reality, what we find has happened is that most folks have, have transitioned to vaping or, or e-cigarettes and have remained on those uh, smoking devices. So as of 2014, 90% of the world's uh, production of all e-cigarette technology, uh, products, oils, they all came from mainland China. But what we also know about China now is that the uh, risk of being caught with a liquid containing uh, nicotine um, for the e-cigarette in China is punishable by two years of uh, prison and a $100,000 fine. They consider it to be a poison. So international concerns are definitely uh, something that I think, you know, when we are in our own environments, you know, we are aware of vaping, we're aware that this is definitely a trend. If we work with youngsters, uh, middle school, high school age kids, they certainly are um, educated about uh, vaping, not from school, but from usually their friends and peer groups. Um, but we also, I think it helps to understand kind of how vast this uh, current state of affairs is when we look, you know, internationally at what's happened. So the World Health Organization, um, a while back, had um, made really three um, statements about um, vaping and e-cigarettes with concern. One is that there's not um, uh, sufficient evidence um, to indicate that folks are going from smoking to e-cigarettes and then nothing. It seems that, again, their findings were that they switch to e-cigarettes and then remain on e-cigarettes. Um, the second thing that we are very thoroughly aware of in any research that's looked at and even just, you know, common knowledge is that e-cigarettes really are a pull and very attractive to younger and younger people. So folks who have never smoked and would never potentially smoke are now trying vaping and e-cigarettes that um, most of the time have at least nicotine in them. And then the other thing, and, and you know, part of the questions that we often get are, so do you compare a cigarette to um, vaping? Certainly cigarettes are worse. Um, and so here's, here's kind of the start of this discussion is that, you know, it appears just as the World Health Organization has found that e-cigarettes and vaping, it appears, are not as harmful as cigarettes. However, they have their own sufficient dangers. World Health Organization has also um, uh, recommended um, various ways to ensure that the product is not pushed. Um, and the other reality is, is that um, it is definitely a concern in the rest of the world, not just this part. So if you take a look at um, where vaping has been banned or restricted, um, I think, again, this is only really the beginning. I think it's come out very quickly and it's grown um, very rapidly. And there are, you know, various uh, companies that manufacture it in the U.S. and, uh, of course, abroad. Um, and because of the, uh, the very rapid growth, 
the laws and lawmakers are still trying to figure out what it means. There's also a lot of research being done to, you know, really find out what some of the health risks are, and we'll talk about some of those as well. So e-cigarettes are banned on all commercial flights in the U.S. They are currently trying to um, increase the age or raise the age from 18 to 21. Currently in Illinois, um, if you're 18, uh, you can purchase um, the oils, you can purchase vaping, you know, very various apparatuses. You can purchase them um, online or in stores. Um, and there is a current uh, uh, vote that has moved on to the House and uh, hoping to raise the age. In terms of the FDA being involved, they have uh, really broken down some of the major risks that occur with the actual um, tools themselves, with the actual smoking de devices themselves. And keeping in mind that most people aren't aware that um, any you know, explosion could happen, but also that there are risks with each of these areas that are located on the, on the device. And you can read through um, some of the concern with um, uh, with charging it and so forth. And of course, keeping in mind that a lot of young folks are using these, um, and they don't necessarily—they're not generally known as uh, you know folks who would be really responsible in in this way. So the American Cancer Society also, of course, has weighed in as conducting their own research. Uh, they are very heavily relying on the FDA to manage this, in a sense, crisis by trying to really encourage them uh, to make sure that they are monitoring it. The um, oils um, and vaping itself as a process, but the individual, um, uh, uh, the manufacturer's uh, um, uh, equipment as well as the oils themselves are not FDA approved. There has been a extension of uh, the deadline for you know, having the oils um, process through with the FDA to find out, um, you know, if they are, you know, safe enough for use or not. Um, but they are at this point, uh, none of them are FDA approved. Again, the American Cancer Society is really relying on the FDA. They are encouraging folks to try smoking uh, uh, cessation without the use of um, devices and indicating that obviously the best pathway is to go from smoking to not but they also know that it's a concern and, and a big pull. So we also know if you've ever seen a box containing uh, vaping or um, uh, any type of, of oil or the apparatus itself, it will say um, that there's a nicotine, you know, there's nicotine potential um, for addiction. So the Centers for Disease Control also have indicated that both in the flavoring itself and in the um, uh, exhaled breath that there are uh, toxins that are being released. So also understanding that um, particles that are deposited into the lungs are also um, a risk for um, disease and concern. Um, also, uh, cancer-causing uh, chemicals are also known to be uh, inside the uh, vape the vapor itself as it's inhaled and exhaled. And so that includes um, the individual who is using the vape and also uh, secondhand, which we'll talk about in a minute. So in terms of looking at um, the actual chemicals that are released or produced at the time of use, we can take a look and obviously you can see uh, that formaldehyde is on there. Um, and this is a research that's been conducted that's just really um, understood that it is, in fact, um, what's being produced with any of the uh, vape discharge, I should say. So in terms of secondhand smoke, like we talked about, um, you can see that they've started to produce these um, signs that instead of just cigarettes, there are also vaping devices uh, that are listed um, because they should be saying, you know, within 25 feet of all buildings and entr entrances. Um, certain government buildings um, have expectations. Um, the World Health Organization helped to outline uh, some of the concerns and some of the way that um, would be better off um, managing the devices. And so um, some organizations have followed through with, with that and have conducted additional research as well. 
So um, aluminum is one of the compounds that we know uh, uh, increases the risk for cardiovascular disease and cancer, and both of those are excreted from the device for both the individual who's smoking and the secondhand smoke. So one thing that if you work with youth um, at all um, or have any contact in your personal life with them, you may know that vaping and e-cigarettes have become very, very attractive. Um, the widespread use and easy access make it also very difficult to regulate. When I have gone to a specific high school and uh, trained their, um, their team of professionals and their deans and principal and uh, the social workers and teachers in the school, we talked a lot about vaping because it is uh, so widespread in the school. It doesn't matter uh, socioeconomic background or, you know, the reality is that um, it's for everyone. It's uh, easily accessible. And again, you know, back in my day, um, you know, we knew who smoked and who didn't because you could smell it on them. And that's simply not the case at this point. You know, I work with clients whose uh, families are encouraged because they, they don't smell the um, cigarette smoke on their, their, their child. So they feel like, oh, they don't smoke. Or if they had before, that all of a sudden they're not smoking anymore. When in, rea in actual reality, um, we're less informed about what they actually might be smoking um, because of the lack of aroma that's followed after vaping. So in terms of comparing high school student use, so basically from 2011 to 2015, um, there was a tenfold um, increase of e-cigarettes. So if you take a look at the four um, different types of uh, uh, devices, so the e-cigarette, a regular cigarette, cigar, and a hookah, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So e-cigarettes, if you um, look and see, it's about one and a half percent of high school students from from uh, beginning in 2011, um, and then growing to uh, 16 percent. Um, and I would honestly say from 2015 to 2018, which we are today, that that number has grown exponentially, um, just really by, you know, feedback and exploring the topic further. I will tell you that if you go online and research um, anything that we talk about today, and, and especially the ease of access that uh, students have to be able to uh, find out how to do some of the tricks that we talk about or find out how to make the... Um, uh, the experience uh, um, a more heightened one. Um, sadly, you will find that um, really, you know, it, it is so common and so little is known about it. So also, I don't know if you've ever seen this picture of this little boy. Uh, I think of, you know, little kids picking up a cigarette, you know, in, in various countries where, you know, there's a lot of poverty and, you know, I, I'm, I remember seeing pictures like this and just being so sad that they didn't know how harmful it was. But the reality also in, in, in this nation is that younger and younger kids are smoking um, or vaping. And so if you take a look at, again, the numbers of e-cigarettes have completely, um, you know, just, I mean, uh, gone from such a, a minute number all the way, you know, up. Uh, on the right-hand uh, side of the e-cigarette, you can see. But what you see with cigarettes in both cases is that the, the use has gone down significantly. So the American Cancer Society, of course, weighs in. Um, and what they say, of course, is that there's, there's basically six things that in our lives that we want to avoid uh, having cancer that we should absolutely avoid. And while it's, it's kind of a difficult um, a difficult thing to understand is that they process tobacco in order to make the oil. Now, they also have synthetic oil, but the reality is that so little is known about that synthetic oil that it's highly likely that that oil that's made from synthetic tobacco could absolutely be more potentially hazardous than actually extracting it from tobacco itself. So what they say is that one in six high school students has used an e-cigarette in the last 30 days. So there's a couple of things that we know are influenced by nicotine. So nicotine can disrupt brain development, interfere with long-term cognitive functioning, and increase the various risk, the risks of various uh, mental health and physical health issues later in life. 
and that is strictly nicotine. That's not smoking a cigarette. So e-cigarettes, like I said before, and, and vaping devices are not FDA approved. So the other significant issue that is definitely all around, if you've ever been around a vaping situation, is that we are renormalizing smoking behavior. And that is absolutely true, and especially when we take into consideration that many of the teens and the young people that are now e-cigaretting e and, and vaping um, is that you know they really highly likely never would have actually tried um, uh, uh, any type of nicotine product at all. I'm going to go back a couple of slides. So in uh, uh, in 2013, um, they found that it was uh, uh, a quarter of a million middle school and uh, high school students had never smoked cigarettes, but they had smoked e-cigarettes. And so that's a quarter of a million who never actually smoked a cigarette. So would that not mean that a quarter of a million people less would be smoking and inhaling substances had they never tried um, e-cigarettes or vaping? So in terms of looking at um, other issues that that um, that come up because of vaping itself. So I've you know researched quite a bit on vaping cigarettes compared to vaping, uh, sorry, vaping compared to smoking cigarettes. And what they find is there's definitely difference, and there's definitely a smaller scale of reaction that the body has compared to cigarettes. But remember that smoking is the number one cancer causer of all time. And so we wouldn't want to take the number one cancer causer, right, and compare it to something that might not be quite as bad, but still also has uh, significant risks. And so I think it's, it's not necessarily fair to compare the two, um, but in doing so, we also notice some, some, some other information that is actually quite beneficial. So one of those things is that there's, there's really two separate things that happen in the throat. So we know that throat cancer is uh, clearly a significant risk for people who smoke. They notice changes in um, the tissue in, in your throat when you smoke, uh, when you e-cigarette or vape. What they notice is that there is uh, a changing where there's a thinning of the, uh, uh, in the lining. What they also notice is that the surface of the throat actually starts to change as well. So they know that this is not a good thing, but they don't know what ramifications that it will eventually have. Uh, again, noting that e-cigarettes and vaping have not really been around for very long. So if you go online and look around or you talk to folks who vape, they will kind of and sometimes, you know, let us know that the information that we might have about it is not actually true. And then in some way, the FDA is making it harder to quit smoking or other kind of hyper various propaganda surrounding e-cigarettes and vaping. But the reality is, um, you know, if, if we at least are trying to advise or educate, then at least we're kind of doing our part. I think what can happen sometimes is, you know, it's not well received. So then we kind of give up and think, well, maybe we are, you know, not right on the on the game. Um, but the reality is, is that the information that we talk about and that we are aware about vaping is that it is not good for you. Um, and so the more that we know about that so that we can educate folks and families, maybe of the clients that we work with, uh, the better off we'll be. So marketing has been made delicious very appealing um you know any oil has the option of m a multitude of of choices so if you look on the screen you can see the dessert combination where it's uh, caffeine and chocolate ice cream flavored with chocolate syrup and caramel and whipped cream and almonds and honestly when i see those flavors i think ah you know maybe the next vacation i go on i wouldn't mind trying that because how cool is that no one would ever, you know, smell the smoke, and you might actually really enjoy it. It might be something new to add to life. Um, certainly, I'd be at higher risk if I had a friend or family member who was close to me who was on that vacation who was also vaping. Um, but that's kind of just how it starts. It doesn't seem like, you know, really such a big deal. Um, and so, you know, they, uh, the oils can either have um, nicotine in them and caffeine or no nicotine, um, or uh, or caffeine and, and uh, coffee flavored chocolate, caramel, 
Um, and so it's, it's kind of an option. You can get it, of course, menthol flavored. Um, but here's, you know, the reality when we think about in terms of using it as a cessation device. Ideally, if someone were to use it, they would have a time frame in which they were going to titrate or cessation, uh, uh, titrate off of it. Um, and so the goal would be that, you know, if they're smoking, then they go from smoking uh, regular cigarettes to uh, switching to an e-cigarette or to a vape device. And then there's a time frame involved, and then there's a quantity involved. And then ideally, within a very short time, they would take themselves off of nicotine um, completely so they're no longer on uh, nicotine oil and then they would they would transition off from that uh, to maybe caffeine or not caffeine depending on what they were using you know initially when they started vaping um, and then continue to titrate down and titrate down until they're no longer using it and that would happen within a, a short amount of time um, but the reality is again is we're not seeing that as the pattern so mod warning so a mod is a modified vape and what it is, is it's, it's modified either by the person who uses it or it's purchased and it's a transitioned from the initial or original vaping apparatus. And so what it is, it's got a larger battery, so the battery stays charged longer, and then the potential for being able to smoke more um, is ever-present. So I can, t I can compare it to a lawnmower. So if you've ever used a lawnmower that is a, a plug-in lawnmower um, compared to one that runs on gas, what you'll probably find, especially if you have high grass, is there's a big difference between the two. One is going to chew up the grass and get it to the level you want it to be, and the other is going to take a longer time. Um, and then so we see that really with these modified devices. You know, you get the full effect after a short amount of time, and there's a ton of smoke involved or vape. At, um, exhaled involved. And if you've ever seen somebody who looks like literally their car is overheating from the inside, that's usually a modified vape. Um, unfortunately, most, I would say, modified vapes are what I see on the street um, in, in the Lake County and McHenry County area. If I go to trick-or-treating with my kids, one of the parents is, you know, vaping, um, you know, using a modified vape with smoke pouring out of the device and their lungs. What we know is that the device needs to be able to heat up whatever substances it's burning up to a certain point but not burning it, which is why it's so fabulous um, to modify vape um, with certain substances, which we'll talk about in a little bit as well. But we also know that manufacturers of the flavorants and the extracts for smell, they have also warned that those have been uh, created and tested for the purpose of cooking not for smoking. And so they have concerns that some of the, uh, uh, the heat that is being used in order to um, cook the substance or the oil is actually, of course, uh, heating up the flavorant and heating up the extract that's inside of the device and therefore making that a risk as well. So we talked about the temper, temperature controlling control. The battery, like we talked about, um, is uh, longer lasting and uh, it is more powerful, so it's pumping more out. So vaping has a very long history. You know, if you think about um, uh, uh, Native Americans, um, you know, sitting around and you think about, you know, what maybe we learned about when we were in grammar school, um, you know, sitting around and, I don't know, in better word, toking it up while they talk about, you know, spiritual experiences and have spiritual experiences um, and talk about, you know, the battle for the day and, and, you know, and use it as a way to calm and relieve and connect. Um, the reality is, is it's the same process. So it's, it's kind of similar to uh, boiling water on the stove and the vapor that comes off of that, inhaling it. Um, but of course, it's not just water vapor, it's whatever substance is inside um, that's also, of course, being uh, breathed in and inhaled for the reaction. So if you look at the screen, you can see um, a little bit about the history. So hookah, I, you know, I was on vacation in Israel a few years ago and um, walked by a shop. And inside the shop, there were all these men in their traditional um, clothing sitting around a table that had this very large glass thing and tubes coming out all around the room and they were all smoking at the same time. Uh, same concept. That's been around for a long time and that's an actual hookah. Um, and then, 
you know, continuing through uh, the years, basically what the hookah is now, which we'll look at uh, in a minute, also is uh, basically a very uh, industrial, I should say very small um, uh, uh creation of that exact process as well. So that one is the one on the bottom left, and that's electronic hookah. And again, that kind of creates the exact same chamber as those big glass jars that I was talking about that were on the on the on the table in, in Israel. So the e-cigarette looks very similar to a cigarette except it's plastic pretty much. Uh, it does need to be um, charged quite often. So vapes, the battery inside the vape apparatus is just a little bit bigger than the e-cigarette, so it lasts longer and it produces, of course, a higher high. And I'll say a higher high because, you know, really that is the reality, um, that the if there's nicotine in it, you're going to feel the effects of the nicotine. Uh, it would be more of a rush, especially initially in using it. The other issue that we know is that, you know, folks who vape, they can vape anywhere. You know, I... Uh, worked with uh, somebody a while back who used to vape and you know we'd be sitting having a conversation and all of a sudden they would just pull the vape out and start smoking because it doesn't bother me because I couldn't really smell it outside of a you know a little bit of uh, uh, mint but you know beyond that initial you know odor it didn't seem to influence anything and I didn't know anything about secondhand smoke to know if it would be harmful or not uh, you know a lot of uh, you know the you know, the area of smoking that is, uh, you know, legal at this point is, is so small. So if, you know, if I work in an organization or company and they have, you know, I have to be, you know, make sure that I'm 25 feet away from the door and I have to sit around the corner on the picnic table and it's, you know, 10 degrees outside, I'm cold, right? So I'm going to probably lessen the amount that I go out and smoke for sure, right? I'm going to wait, you know, make sure my work is done, maybe take two, maybe three smoke breaks a, a day. Um, but the reality is, is with vaping, you don't have to go outside. So the, the frequency that it's used um, is, is, is much more um, compared to cigarettes. And so in saying that, you know, just the pattern of lifestyle that is um, kind of created with vaping and e-cigarette is something that we haven't really dealt with in the U.S. at least in probably 20 years when we could sit at our desk and, you know, sit in the boardroom and even in court and smoke. Um, and so that's it's creating this different type of culture. Uh, you know, parents also, you know, for the most part, you know, our culture was that you wouldn't really smoke up close and personal or in the same car with your kid, you know, um, but that's not the reality with vaping. So the modified vape, as you can see, the cartridge, it looks like, but it's actually the battery, is uh, much larger. And so, again, it, it pumps a lot more uh, nicotine or whatever's being smoked. And then jewels. So we're going to talk a little bit about jewels. Jewels are, to be all honest, super cute. Uh, they look like they're just um, a, a jump drive for a computer. A lot of uh, schools encountered um, this when they first started coming out not very long ago. I would say they became very popular in this last school year. Um, but what it is is there's a tiny little cartridge, and just because I say tiny does not mean that it is less potent. It's actually much more potent. There's a tiny cartridge on the right-hand side of the of the bottom right picture, you'll see those tiny four little things. Those are the cartridges and that's all the oil that's in it. And if you take a look at the next slide, you can see it a little bit closer. So it's a tiny bit bigger than the jump drive. If you look at the picture in the middle, you can see how the battery is charged. So schools would find that they were um, giving the students their issued, you know, school issued laptop. And while they're working in class, they're literally charging their vapes and the teachers didn't know what it was. So the middle, um, you can see that tiny little, the insert that goes into the computer, if I was more technical, I could tell you the name of it. Um, that is actually the battery. So it's charging right there, and it's only a magnet that connects the, the, the actual part that's you know, inhaled in to the actual battery. And so initially, 
it was, and I think for the most part, many schools and and you know therapists that work with with students, we really don't know what it is. We're like, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I've never seen that before. It's a lot less oil, and it doesn't look as big as a vape. So ver- therefore, maybe it's not as bad. Maybe it's something different. And it was definitely marketed as not being an e-cigarette and not being vape. But in actual reality, it's both things in one. It's small like an e-cigarette, but it pumps out like a vape. So I want to compare the vape and the the Juul. So on the left hand side, we've got you know really a Juul is about thirty five dollars online, and it comes with um, you know the ability to to buy additional pods. Uh, four pods is about sixteen to twenty bucks. Um, the amount of juice that's inside of that, which is the oil, is uh, 0.7, but you can refill it. So initially, these were not um, known to be refillable, so it was actually quite costly, especially for younger you know younger folks. Um, but the reality is, is there's now YouTube videos. You can, you know, uh, Google YouTube that um, will show you exactly how to add and refill the oil. And the reason I say that again is because many young people use it. It's very difficult to find one of those on a student. Uh, most of our schools that do searches don't actually touch the student, um, and so even if they did, they wouldn't necessarily, you know, find it. Um, but the amount of juice. Um, in an actual vape is 1.6, um, and so it's quite a bit more, um, but they can purchase the juice bottle for about $20. So what they do now is they'll typically um, purchase the $20 bottle of juice and then um, take off the, I'm going to go back one slide, on the left-hand side where we talked about the pods, um, they'll take off the black part of that little tiny pod thing, and they'll also take out um, the filter and the coil. And then they will refill it uh, with like an eyedropper of oil. And the reason that that's really important is because the difference between the two in terms of, and I'll call it again, a high um, and concentration of nicotine is that, you know, a vape, even though it's pushing all of this, you know, for a better word, smoke, vape out of it and out of the lungs of the person who's smoking it, it's actually considered, you know, in terms of comparison for a light smoker. But the jewel, on the other hand, is, um, you know, it's kind of stated around internet that, you know, it's someone who's really serious about smoking um, and that you get a crazy buzz from it and the nicotine hits you really hard. And so that's something I think is, you know, really interesting and, and quite alarming is that most of the folks that are using that are younger. You know, you see it everywhere in schools. If, you, if there's a, a high school that confiscates, um, you know, such devices, a plethora of them um, will be, you know, presented, you know, in, you know, if, you know, if, nonetheless. So, so they're everywhere, really, um, for lack of a better word. And the, the reality is that folks who have never smoked before and are nicotine naive are now inhaling large quantities of nicotine. The other thing that's important to know in terms of uh, younger folks and maybe some 27, 28, 30 year olds as well, uh, which are still kind of young, um, you know, really there's a lot of um, opportunity for them to, to do tricks. And so that's something that's really popular as well. So. Uh, typically, you know, a group of young folks might get together and, you know, play ping pong and hang out at the pool and all. And inevitably, at this point, one of them probably has a vape. And one of them will probably pull out that vape and say, hey, do you want to, you know, try it? No one will know. No one can smell it on you. And that's unfortunately just how it kind of happens. And it doesn't matter, again, socioeconomic status, you know, you are in. It does not matter. Um, it, it's not a thing like smoking became. It doesn't have that stigma to it at all. In fact, it's the opposite right now. So one of the smoking tricks is to blow circles, O's, um, uh, other letters, other shapes, designs. Uh, really kind of looks pretty cool, of course, until you realize how many puffs the person has to take in such a short amount of time in order to get that amount of uh, design around them. We'll call it design. So if you look at the second picture, you can see all those O's around him. Um, and if you think about how much, uh, how many draws he had to have in order to uh, to uh, to pump out that much vape, uh, clearly it's a danger, and especially depending on what's inside the vape, right? The other thing is uh, a new, uh, relatively new um, uh, trick or way to inhale more nicotine or more substance 
is to drip. And what they do is if you, if you take a look at the third picture, what that is is they're dripping it into the coil. So uh, the way that this, the apparatus itself works is that the oil would go under that, but, and it, it's pulled in by a fiber or the coil. And so above that is actually where they're putting it, which actually means that they're burning it more directly and they're gonna get a bigger hit, for lack of a better word, um, from, the, uh, uh, from the device. And then the fourth picture is the light. And the reason that's important is because it's, you know, increasingly popular to do like a light show and uh, do a YouTube video to go along with it while you're smoking. And so, again, with all of those, uh, the risk becomes the larger quantity of use um, and the way that they're using it becomes even more risky than it would be if they were using it in a way that, you know, would be similar to a cigarette. So, we know that nicotine itself is dangerous. Um, it's harmful for the body, for the brain, um, for emotional development. Um, and then, you know, also, you know, recognizing that, you know, when I've seen uh, vaping around, just around outside, or, you know, I went, recently went to Six Flags and they were vaping, you know, around, you know, wherever I was. They have a, you know, designated area and people generally respected that. Um, but we also know that that oil is somewhere, that they have a refill cartridge, that there's more at the house. And so what we also know is that the nicotine alone inside of that, if an adult were to consume it, they would die. And so the reality also, of course, is that smaller bodies, babies, kids, if they were to get a hold of that, the potential for them to lethally overdose on the amount of nicotine that's in there um, is definitely a concern as well. We also know that lifetime use of tobacco uh, and or nicotine is greater um, if someone is uh, using vaping, like we talked about a little bit before. Um, and non-smokers, like we talked about, become nicotine dependent, which is something that has never really been a big concern. Uh, certainly, maybe someone would have you know, gotten a hold of their parents' uh, nicotine patch and tried it out, but this is a whole different um, way of use. So we also know that diabetes and heart issues uh, have also been noted in research about vaping and e-cigarettes. So regarding the, uh, the, the oil that's inside of, of the um, juice, so it's typically called juice. Uh, there's always an oil. There has to be an oil for it to uh, produce the vape that it does. It's just a matter of which type of oil. There's some oils that are thinner and they don't look like they would be as hazardous. And then there's some that are super thick um, and you can, you know, you could even go to a vape shop and, and check it out, um, but just don't be tempted to buy it. Um, but there's also other things that we've noticed and it's uh, only from vaping that we have, there's been, you know, specific research just on vaping to, um, to look and see what is actually happening. So what they know is that younger and younger people are getting what we used to call smoker's cough, where somebody would cough and cough and cough and cough and cough. Also bronchitis, bronchitis and chronic bronchitis. Um, we also know that COPD uh, is uh, exacerbated by folks who vape. Um, we also know additionally that, uh, that when you are a vape, a consistent vapor, that uh, when you have a cut or have injured yourself, that it takes much longer to heal. We know that same similar situation happens when you're a smoker. But, um, but knowing that as well uh, with vaping, I think it's important to, to note. I think that, you know, if you have a cut or you've had a surgery um, or some other type of situation, that the wound healing actually takes longer um, if you're consuming. So the other research that was done that was particularly fascinating, unfortunately, they did kill mice in the process. Um, but they took mice and they put them into an environment uh, where essentially they were breathing in vape. And and um, and after you know and and after engaging in the in the experiment in the trial, they then took the mice and and killed them. And when they opened them up, what they found was that the mice had three times as many bacteria in their bodies as those that had not been in the vaping environment. Um, and so what they also uh, are very concerned about is you know if you've ever seen like the um, you know cough commercial. 
um, you know, Kleenex commercial, cold medicine commercial, you see, you know, somebody sneeze and then you just see all this like, you know, sprinkling of their sneeze all around the room and you kind of freaked out a little bit like that's really gross. Um, but the reality is we're breathing in bacteria all the time, just even if no one sneezes around us, right? If I touch the mouse that's in the office I'm in and then I touch my face, which I inevitably will do that at some point, um, you know, bacteria potentially has just been introduced to my body, right? I've breathed it in in some way when I walked in the room um, and so on. But what they find is that um, they believe that the oil is actually coating the bacteria that they're breathing in and causing it to be kind of like armor so that the body then cannot fight off the bacteria. And so folks that vape, they also know, um, frequently come down with colds uh, more often than folks who don't. So now let's talk about the uh, another interesting um, part about vaping. So what, like we talked about before, vaping is not just about, um, you know, maybe nicotine, maybe not, uh, maybe, um, uh, you know, caffeine, maybe not. Uh, maybe a, a certain dessert flavoring. Um, but the reality is that other things are smoked in vapes. And those other things are anything else that can be smoked. So anything that can be smoked is actually um, vapable. The way that it's done is it's, it's, it's not very difficult, but um, it's kind of like making tea. Uh, you know, it depends on what you dilute it in, whether it's uh, water and alcohol added and then, and then put into and mixed in the oil. So the reality is that most um, most of the time, we really have no idea what the person is smoking. Now, I will say there's an exception to that. There is a brief moment where if someone is uh, smoking or, or vaping heroin or vaping marijuana, you would likely smell it for a very, very brief moment. And then it will go away. And particularly difficult to smell if they have cherry flavorant or, you know, strawberry or raspberry because you smell sweet and then you think it's gone and that you were crazy. So it's one of those things where you're like, you might smell it and you go, I must be crazy. You can't smell a vape. But you can. You can actually smell that very light odor. Um, it's also kind of like a, um, a, a vaporizer. When you were a kid, maybe, if you tried to inhale the vapor from the vaporizer, there's kind of an odor to it. It's so slight that you would barely smell it. It almost smells like maybe like a plasticky kind of um, almost almost moldy smell, depending on where, where your vaporizer has been. Um, and so it's like that. It's there and then it's gone so quickly. Um, but the reality is, is um, you can smell it uh, for just a brief second, but then it's gone and you don't really smell it on the person or on their clothing necessarily. Uh, if you've ever smelled heroin, it smells like a mixture of wet cat, um, sorry, wet leather, cat, and marijuana all mixed together in one pungent aroma. If you've ever smelled that, then you, you know, likely know what heroin smells like, but you can, you can use your imagination. So kratom is a substance that is grown in Southeast Asia. It is also illegal in Southeast Asia, but you can purchase it online or on the street here in the, in the U.S. Um, you can you can purchase large quantities of it. So when I was, you know, probably early in my career in substance use, I always wanted to figure out why is it they cut, you know, something with something else. Um, but the, the reason is this. It's the same as when we purchase our food and they add cornstarch and glucose and all these other modifiers and all that other stuff. We know that if you've studied glucose at all or if you've studied, um, you know, any type of a sugar substitute that actually has sugar in it is that those things actually become something you want, right? If you have a chocolate bar, it's not going to satisfy you to have one. You're going to want another one an hour or two later or the next day at the same time. And that's because the body now liked what it just had. Um, and so sometimes in this situation, the, the additive is made because the substance then becomes more appealing because the high is higher because they've added it. But it also stretches it out. If you have a pure substance and there's, you know, it's expensive, you add something that's much cheaper to it, and now you've got a lot more of it. And so that's what happens um, with this as well. So it can be used as a tea. You can make your own tea. Um, I can tell you that... Uh, you know, a, a student could be walking around school with what looks like a cup of coffee or a, a thermos of water, and it could have this in it. Um, the high would be similar to what a high from marijuana was about 15, 20 years ago. Um, it's uh, not as potent as weed in some ways, but then here's the other thing. So recently there was a, a news article on how uh, they were using Kratom to uh, detox folks off of heroin because it binds to the receptor in the same way. But here's the problem. 
it also creates a psychosis. Um, and so what they found is that as they started to titrate them, yes, they were able to withdraw more comfortably, but then sometimes they became psychotic. So that's something else to be aware of. You can go online and, and YouTube, you'll find a very handsome, attractive um, young guy who will tell you how amazing Kratom is and how it's the best thing he's found since weed. Uh, he'll tell you that it's not addictive and it's a fabulous substance. But then he will also tell you that the day that you use it, likely the next day you'll have to double the amount that you use or you're gonna get irritated and agitated and mean and your family's gonna wonder what happened to you. Um, and so in that, he's noting that both you have tolerance and you have withdrawal from it. Um, and so the other way it's taken is the pill form as well. There's three different ways, uh, I should say, types that are purchased. One is it's like a cocaine high. The other is that it's more like a heroin high. Um, and then the third way that can be purchased, it starts like a heroin high, um, where it's kind of euphoric. And then uh, I should say, sorry, it starts as a cocaine high, where you're you know, really high and kind of jittery and excited. And then over time, um, turns into more of a, a heroin euphoric high. So again, uh, easily accessible, you know, the advertising is everywhere. This is supposedly the best uh, device for smoking weed. We've had uh, families come into Gateway and say, uh, you know, my, my, my kid is, you know, coming off of uh, uh, smoking cigarettes and I don't want him to start so smoking cigarettes again. Here's his vape. Please let him smoke this. You have to let him smoke this while he's here. And they go ahead and try to hand us the oil from the vape. And we look at it and say, how on earth do you know what is inside of this? Um, and so the reality is, again, especially for younger folks, but, you know, I mean, the reality, too, is that, you know, most of our families, they're not necessarily um, aware of what the person who's, who's using substances is using. And so it's so easy for them to uh, use something else, to put something else in the oil, to add it to it. And they might be thinking, hey, it's just the nicotine that's in there. And really, their loved one is smoking heroin. So... Um, and we don't, again, have to necessarily answer this, but um, but just in terms of really bringing it home and, and thinking about this, you know, one of the biggest uh, struggles right now in the field is this question of marijuana and what does it do and, oh, it's not as bad as the rest of the stuff and if he's just using that, isn't that so much better than if he was doing whatever? And so, you know, really one of the best ways that I found to navigate this conversation with either the client or generally the client's family is more effective is, you know, if someone really loves weed, they really, really like it. They just, it's their thing. And you may know people, uh, maybe you're one of them, hopefully not, but you may know people in your own life that have smoked weed for 20, 30 years, 40 years, and everything seems like it's okay. Like their life hasn't like become, you know, demolished and, you know, knocked down. They're able to work, they have a family, and so on and so forth. But if you're close enough to them, I'm confident that you also are aware that there's a distraction. So that distraction, while it doesn't seem like a heroin distraction where they're going to end up in the hospital and overdose and almost die or maybe die, the reality is they're distracted from other minute details of life, like interpersonal relationships. You know, I had a, a friend years and years ago who uh, she worked with teenagers and as soon as she would get in the car from working with the kids, she would, you know, light up in her, you know, one hitter and she would just rely on that through the course of the day that she would work. She'd be thinking about that. So here you are working in a program with adolescents, right? And you're, you know, engaging with them, talking to them about positive lifestyle, talking to them about not using drugs, encouraging them, supporting them, helping them with coping skills, but yet the main coping skill is that. And so it doesn't have to be to that degree, but the reality is maybe it's that person who they don't smoke anywhere but home, but when they're home, that's what they're doing, or they're playing video games and they're at home. And so here's the question. If they had never smoked marijuana and if they didn't smoke it daily or weekly or however often they indulge in it, what would their work possibly have been like? What would their education possibly have been like? Would their relationships be richer? Would when they're watching TV, they're actually with the person on the couch watching TV rather than in their own world kind of uh, in, intoxicated from marijuana? How would life decisions be impacted had they never smoked marijuana? 
Um, and so those are questions that I think are more uh, deliberately focused on the functioning of the person and rather than the big question of whether it should be legal or, you know, whether it should be used for medicinal purposes and all of that. What I found is that the folks that I work with, once they get to me, there's lifestyle impairment. And most of the time it starts with the marijuana. Um, and, and I say that, you know, knowing that maybe sometimes there's depression or anxiety, but had we handled that in a better way, they might be still in high school or they might be still um, able to be promoted at their work rather than kind of stuck where they've been for 20 years. So that can't be, um, I think, overlooked in the conversation about weed. Um, but the way the uh, what we know about it is there's tolerance, there's withdrawal, there's compulsive use, regardless of consequences, right? Uh, you know, someone is told that if they smoke marijuana again and have it in their system, they're going to go to jail, but they can't stop, right? So they don't stop. Um, we also know that uh, you know uh, the marijuana today is much more potent than it used to be. Uh, you know, if you were aware of it, you know, 20 years ago, you know that it was something that you could probably be high and manage, um, but uh, struggle a little bit. Um, marijuana today has taken on a whole new face. It's gone from a content of about 3% THC to about 27%. Um, and so that's 275 times more potent than weed 10 years ago, which is almost unbelievable. So, uh, there are, in Colorado, uh, psych units that are specifically designated and set up for psychosis related to um, marijuana. Um, and I don't know about you, but I can't imagine being psychotic. And that seems like a pretty big uh, risk, um, but yet it's very much overlooked. And when I first was told that, I doubted it and questioned it, and even the person who told me had doubted it. But her sister worked in a as a nurse in one of the psych hospitals that literally the only um, uh, reason that they were there was that they had smoked marijuana and literally were now in acute psychosis. What we also know is that in emergency rooms in this area that, uh, you know, THC-induced um, psychosis is 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 happening uh, nearly daily. So in terms of looking at marijuana and co-occurring disorders, I've had a lot of people over the years say, well, he's got such high anxiety or his ADHD is so bad that the only thing that helps is marijuana. But what we know is that research indicates completely opposite of that. What we know is that anxiety and depression and paranoia all increase when folks use marijuana. So if that's anxiety, depression, and paranoia increase, then the very thing that folks kind of, you know, will say about it is actually opposite of what research indicates. And we also know that folks who have schizophrenia who smoke marijuana experience more symptoms and more hospitalizations if they're a marijuana smoker as well. So additionally, K2 and spice, what is a very difficult uh, to um, identify even today. So initially, you know, in Gateway about about seven, eight years ago, K2 became popular, became a thing. It was considered to have the limitless high. Um, it was synthetic, so it couldn't easily be um, found in urine tox screens for probation. Um, it was, it's now illegal, um, but you can still purchase it at, um, you know, independently owned gas stations. Uh, it costs about $40 for a bag. The bags um, on here, that looks like for an older, you know, 20, 22-year-old, but re really there's some that have Scooby-Doo on them, really cute little packaging that makes it look enticing. Now, what can be done with this is, again, it can be made into a tea and then vaped. It is a um, substance that, while under the influences, causes most of the time acute psychosis. Anyone who's ever used it will say um, that at least once, but usually multiple times, they felt um, panicky. They felt like their heart was going to be out of their chest. They felt like someone was chasing them. They went through the woods naked. Uh, they ran out of their house and couldn't figure out why. Um, oftentimes end up in the psych hospital and then tell you they can't figure out why they kept using it because it was so frightening. Again, one of the situations is that we don't know what they're smoking. So somebody could smoke marijuana, what they thought was weed, but it's laced with K2 or spice because again, the high can be higher. Um, and so emergency rooms um, and families are concerned because we don't know what it is. Something else that we find is that the psychosis that they experience um, with either substance does not actually respond to um, 
is not actually responding to uh, traditional psychotropic medications. So they found a couple of different things. They found that one is the person is psychotic while they're high, and then it goes away. They're psychotic while the substance is in their body, which could be up to 30 days. Or they leave the hospital after five weeks, six weeks, and they're still psychotic. And again, like I said, you can inject someone in the butt with Haldol, but it's not going to really um, counteract the psychosis from this. So what can you smoke? Again, I was talking a little bit about things you can sm that things that you can vape, anything that you can smoke. So crack, heroin. You know, there's a account of an emergency room doctor who had um, uh, they had revived an individual. He had overdosed and essentially died from heroin. Uh, that was laced with um, fentanyl, and they brought him to the hospital. Three days later, they were going to discharge him. He went back into the bathroom and used his vape again and went into the same situation where they had to use Narcan to revive him. Honey hash oil, we'll talk about very briefly, and I'm going to talk probably faster to get through this so we don't miss anything, but I might have to skip a couple of slides. Um, so, so if you've ever been around a client or known someone who's used honey hash oil or, or earwax or dabs, as they call it, um, something that should be known is while it's a very kind of um, a very culturally uh, open situation when someone tries it, you know, they really will say it's not a big deal. It's the same as marijuana. It's really not. It is um, incredibly potent marijuana, and what they've done is they've essentially extracted the, basically, if you can imagine, the sap off of each leaf of marijuana. And then they've made this um, using, you know, anything and everything to uh, basically cook it down. Um, they've made this now 80% pure T THC. And if you can imagine that a 27% THC is a hallucinogen, an 80% is that someone is blown. They are out of their mind. So if you encountered somebody who uh, smokes uh, 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 cannabis and then they try this, there is a definite difference as, as if it's a completely different substance because it is really. Um, like I said, I'm going to skip through a couple of slides um, so that we can get through. Um, I will note that um, there are some positive benefits to nicotine um, for folks who have uh, uh, acute uh, schizophrenia. What you'll notice is that you can usually tell who they are. They usually are the one in Walmart or, or whoever's, you know, uh, uh, the dollar store that, you know, there's aroma of cigarette smoke. It's pouring out of them, and it's usually because they've, in, uh, they've used so much. Uh, what happens is, is when they smoke a cigarette, they have an uh, alertness that's there and their memory restores while they're under the influence of the cigarette. So you can imagine why it's so enticing. But the reality is, of course, that the only way to get nicotine is the ways that we currently do and they're not healthy. Um, but they are doing research on that. Um, let me skip a couple. Okay, so bacterial meningitis. Huge issue. I had a, a friend of mine in college who got bacterial meningitis, and you know, basically, if they hadn't gotten him to the hospital, you know, within about 20, 30 minutes of, of the time that they did, um, he would have passed away. They have that, you know, really great commercial on now that advises about bacterial meningitis and how it really is a thing and that it is a concern, and that one in 10 people die, and you've got 24 hours to get to the hospital. Um, and even with that, you know, usually they end up an amputee of some sort, which is actually the case with my friend. Um, it is um, very prevalent um, in, with, within certain activities. Unfortunately, one of them is drinking from a water fountain, but the other is absolutely sharing a cigarette or a vape, which, of course, like we talked about before, the way that folks are introduced from, by a vape is not that they just go out to the store and they buy it for the first time themselves. They usually try somebody else's, and so we know that's a risk, particularly with the college age group. So that very chill attitude is obviously a concern, the culture of it just being accepted and that there aren't any medical issues or concerns regarding it. The other thing is that, of course, they explode. You know, at Gateway, whether you work in the clinical office or around clients, we don't allow them. Clients can't have them. They're not allowed to be in the facility because of the risk of explosion, and you can see the picture that is the case with this person, this young gentleman that um, had this encounter with one. The other reality is that, you know, um, as a culture, sometimes we hear that the Say No campaign, you know, Nancy Reagan back in the day didn't really change anything, that it was just kind of a, a slogan that, like, didn't really impact life. 
And the, the truth is that that's not actually true. You know, many of us, including myself, when I heard about, you know, when, sitting in the library in second grade, you just say no. If somebody offers you something, you just say no. And, and this understanding that it's not good for you and that you say no. Uh, many of us on the phone, maybe that was your experience too. Someone once said, don't do it because it's not good for you, and you didn't do it. Unfortunately, we work with a group of people that that didn't work for. That just means there's something else that we need to do for that group of people, but not to throw it all out. I can tell you that my now sixth grader, a few years ago, um, we saw somebody out standing outside of Walmart smoking a cigarette, and he was like, mom, 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 we should go tell him. We should go tell him how dangerous it is that he's doing that, that, that he could die from cancer and that he can blah. And I couldn't believe that this is the message that he got because he got this message, and that's the culture right now with cigarette smoke. That's why we see the significant decline in cigarette smoke, one of the reasons. The other is that vaping has become very, very popular. But the reality is that really, you know, a, comp a campaign of, of education and, and, and helping folks to know what to say when they encounter someone who says, hey, try this. You know, those, those situations are the things that are really going to help our clients um, and families and the, the next generation to actually, you know, be more aware of what happens when you vape, but also be able to say no to it when they're encountered uh, by it. So being able to, you know, help role play that, no, that's nasty, dude, that was on your mouth, I don't want that, or something like that to get the, the focus off of, you know, take, you know, take it and try. Uh, so the reality, again, saying no, it can be helpful, it can be very helpful, um, but especially in terms of really preparing folks to be able to say no, role playing with them if you work with youth or adolescents, or if you've got kids that, you know, you haven't had this conversation frequently enough. Uh, it can be very helpful in, you know, really kind of fighting this battle out and just being aware that some of the risks that there really are out there, I think, is, is really important. So with that, um, if you have questions, I know that there have been some questions that have kind of come through a little bit. I know one of the questions that has been asked is what's the difference between the amount of nicotine in a vape uh, drag or the vape itself um, being, you know, used as compared to a cigarette. And the problem is, is you really can't compare it. The reason you can't compare it um, is because the cigarette um, is a regimented amount. The vape is completely not regimented by anybody or anything at this point. So again, like I said, the FDA has not approved any of them. Um, and so, you know, th there's not a, a specific amount. Additionally, like I said before, you know, you can make in the vape oil whatever you want to make in it. You can buy it with heroin or whatever in it too, but you don't know the amount of nicotine uh, that's in it because it's based on the apparatus that you're actually using. So if you're using an e-cigarette, if you're using a vape, if you're using a modified vape, if you're using a, a, a hookah, um, all of those things are different. And so the, the amount that's being taken in um, would determine, you know, how much would actually be there. So again, it's, it's kind of impossible. So, yes, yeah, so one of the questions is um, the e-cigarette is extracted from tobacco. Yes, initially all of the, all of the oil was extracted from t tobacco, but now there's companies in the U.S. that have made a synthetic tobacco. And so the risk with that is anything that's synthetic is usually much more potent and has its own risks associated. So while we might say, oh, that's really great, you know, it's not tobacco, the reality is we don't know what the risk of the other is. But yes, there are synthetic oils at this point. Um, so not all of them are made from tobacco. Many of them still are. So can a test from marijuana come back negative if you are using a vape? You're still ingesting the substance, so it would still come back positive. Although, I do not know the time frame. I think that it would be the same, but I would be hypothesizing on that. So there is a no nicotine option. When you're using any of the apparatuses, the, 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 uh, the smoking devices, uh, you can um, uh, use oil that does not have nicotine in it. So yes. Uh, the question was, uh, is there a way that you can, you know, vape without nicotine? And the answer is yes, you can get it without nicotine. <coughs> so the difference between an e-cigarette and a vape, the e-cigarette is smaller, the vape is larger, the vape pumps out more of the product. So you get higher from it. And I like to use the word higher because I think it's easy for us to think that, oh, it's just a cigarette. 
but it's not the case. Even if it's just nicotine inside, it's still nicotine being pumped in a uh, very, um, it's, it's being basically pushed out. So again, if you can imagine um, that despite how our culture is kind of like laissez-faire when we see a vape, if we look at the amount of smoke that's around that person, uh, the reality is all of that smoke likely went into their lungs and all of it's coming out of their lungs. And that's because they've vaped it or used a modified vape and it's larger and has a, a stronger battery. Many of the juices are made from tobacco. That was the question, or are they synthetic? And we answered that. Um, Uh, the other question was, um, in Illinois, is it currently legal to vape? Um, yes, 18 and older. Um, and uh, so <clears throat> the uh, one of the issues is that the fine for selling to someone younger is um, not very much. And so what they find is that the stores, vape stores that sell to minors, which actually they find are most of them, actually most of them, there was some research done on how many, and I think it was like all but one of like 16 that tried to purchase, uh, but nonetheless, they, uh, uh, you know, the, the fee, the fine is not very much, and so they continue to sell, they just pay the fine and they keep on selling to whoever they want to. The legislation that is uh, wanting to be passed now is that the uh, burden would actually go um, on the shop owner uh, rather than the adolescent uh, or the youngster that's purchasing it. So the appeal with um, vaping if it's not nicotine is the question, what's the, what's the uh, benefit? So the reality is, and it's my guess, my interpretation from what I know about it would be that many times there's nicotine in it. Because nicotine is what gives, you know, the high, the boost, the uh, blood pressure rise and the, oh, I feel like I can run for a second, that adrenaline. Um, and so a lot of times it does have nicotine in it. Most of the time it has nicotine in it because that's the actual desire. Unless, of course, it has another substance in it. Like maybe it just has uh, caffeine. But remember that caffeine is actually dangerous too. And if you're smoking large quantities, which generally folks that are vaping are using and using and using and using with no, you know, not necessarily feeling uh, that they need to stop because it's not dangerous is what their perspective is. Ah, let me end with one uh, one uh, comment. So uh, <clears throat> normally I share a story that I didn't, and, and here's one of the, the big issues with the juice itself. Let's just say it's just juice. Some of the questions are coming in about if there's no nicotine in it, what, what is the harm? Um, so still processed from a tobacco. If it's not tobacco, it's a synthetic tobacco, which again, like I said, dangerous. Um, if it has nicotine, of course, nicotine has its own issues. Um, and the oil itself, like I said before, the flavorants and the um, aromas, those are known to um, be of question. They were not made to go into a vape and be cooked before someone inhales them directly into their lungs. They were made for food products, and the food product companies that created them are very concerned about risks of cancer and other health issues. But the last story that I'll share with you very briefly, um, so back in the day when I was quite young, but I'll never forget the story, uh, I was watching an Oprah episode, and on there, there was a, a couple that was talking about this horrible travesty that had happened with their, their kids. They were about uh, 16 to 18 months old at the time. They were twins. One of them got into a Johnson & Johnson baby, um, baby oil bottle and aspirated it into their lungs. And I remember hearing it thinking, you know, kind of in my mind, well, how would they get that out? How would they get that out? The answer is they can't. So we were talking about the issue with smoker's cough, and we were talking about the issue with bronchitis and other changes that happen in the lungs. Also, there's a, um, uh, the COPD issue where it's almost like the, the lungs become, rather than air packets, they become more like elastic or brittle. That's another issue that has come up. And they know that that's, that's from the oil. So that's not from nicotine, that's not from marijuana, that's not from anything that they're smoking in it. It's the oil itself that's causing that. And so what actually happened, unfortunately, to this little baby was that the baby, there's no way to get oil out of your lungs. Once it's there, it's simply there. Um, and so as they're vaping in, they're vaping this kind of like, almost like a vapor water, but it has oil in it. So it's being um, deposited into the lungs and there's no way to get it out. 
So like I said, unfortunately, that baby died um, as a result. There's nothing they can do to scope it out. There's nothing they can do to uh, air it out. It's just there. And so that's actually the same phenomenon that they're finding uh, with folks who vape. So with that, we will go ahead and um, uh, we can continue to answer questions online. But I wanted to make sure that we give you your, uh, your time back because we went a little bit over. Thank you, Rachel. We have concluded the one-hour training session. If you are logging off as a courtesy to Gateway Foundation and Rachel, please take out a few minutes to fill out the brief survey to offer feedback about today's webinar. Also, be on the lookout for an email as we will be sending you a link to the presentation slides as well as a recording of today's presentation for future reference and for you to share maybe with coworkers or anybody else that might be interested. Again, your CEU certificates will be delivered via email with the email address you provided when you registered. You should expect those within the next four weeks, possibly sooner. Thank you all for attending. At this time, our presenter will be answering questions that maybe we didn't get to via the webinar chat tool. But we appreciate it and we look forward to having future webinars. Take care. <laughs>